Welcome to the Happy Bones, Happy Life podcast. I'm Margie Bissinger, a physical therapist and integrative health coach, and I am your host and guide on our journey to discover the keys to stronger bones, more happiness, and the secrets to live your best life ever. From nutrition to stress, from exercise to happiness, you will gain revolutionary insights from our leading experts. It is time for you to discover the health and happiness you deserve. Hey, Margie here. Did you know that environmental toxins can have a major negative effect on our bones and overall health? Well, this is a topic we're going to delve into today with our special guest, Lara Adler. And Lara is an environmental toxins expert and educator and a certified holistic health coach who teaches health practitioners how to eliminate the number one thing holding their clients back from the results they are seeking, the unaddressed link between chemicals and chronic health problems. She trains practitioners to become experts in everyday toxic exposures so they can improve client outcomes without spending hundreds of hours researching it on their own. By combining environmental health education and business consulting, she's helped thousands of health professionals in over 25 countries around the world elevate their skill set so they get better results for their clients and become sought after leaders in the growing environmental health and detoxification field. And Lara was my teacher in this, so I can, she's just fabulous, and I'm so excited for our, our interview today because in this talk, we really go into things that everybody can do. We talk about plastics, BPA, cosmetics, and, we, and she gives us easy tips that we can put into our life right away. So stay tuned. Welcome, Lara. I am so excited to see you. I think it's been since we saw each other in person um, two summers ago, so it's been a while. But yeah. you know, you're my teacher, and you've taught me so much that has really helped me in my practice. And this has such an important relationship to our bones and overall health. And a lot of times people are afraid of this, but you present it in such an amazing way. And I'm just thrilled to have you because out of all the people, I just think you're the best. (laughs) And you make it manageable. You make this manageable. So let's just dig right in because there's so much. We could probably talk five hours on this topic, but I really want to give people tangible things that they can take away from this. So why don't we just start out with what what are environmental toxins and how do they affect us? Right. So that's actually a, a big question, <laughs> and I think that um, I'll I'll give some context so that we have an understanding of what what we're talking about specifically. Um, you know, I think most people when they hear the phrase environmental toxin or environmental chemical, they're generally thinking of things like you know air pollution and oil spills, things that are kind of out there and unrelated to their personal lives, or they're thinking of, you know, nature and the environment and that kind of stuff. They're not thinking about their personal immediate environment. Um, And certainly things like air pollution and oil spills and those sort of big environmental toxic uh, uh, issues are uh, environmental toxins that can directly affect our health. But in the field of environmental health or environmental medicine, um, we tend to look specifically at the chronic everyday exposures or occupational exposures that people are getting to chemicals just through living their normal everyday lives or through their work and has not necessarily had very much to do with these sort of big macro ideas of what we think of as an environmental toxin. So environmental toxins are generally speaking going to be toxins of some kind, whether they're synthetic or um, natural, that we encounter every single day and that our bodies are being challenged to address. Um, Another way to kind of contextualize what we mean by toxin is, um, is just something that has a biological impact on the body in some way that has a negative outcome. In the same way that most people think environmental toxins are out there, they think toxin is something that's going to cause like an immediate acute poisoning, right? If something is toxic, they think, oh, if this was, quote, toxic, wouldn't I be rushing to the emergency room? Um, I saw an article years ago on, I think it was one of these life hacker 
online um, websites saying if you know plastic water bottles were so toxic why aren't millions of people pouring into emergency rooms and I was like oh my god you're totally missing the point buddy um, because that's not the kind of acute uh, uh, toxicity that we're talking about if somebody drinks a bottle of bleach yes that is a go to the emergent emergency room situation but when we're talking about chronic level uh, chronic low levels of toxic exposures we're not generally looking at really acute outcomes we are instead looking at these really low levels that cumulatively over time can tip the scales into being predisposed or actually developing some kind of issue or their exposures that exacerbate ex issues that we already have. So sometimes exposures might take a decade, two decades, three decades before they start manifesting in symptoms, which is why it's sometimes tricky to kind of pin down cause and effect in this space. But that's what we're looking at. We're looking at low levels of substances, man-made or natural, like lead, arsenic, mercury, these are natural. Um, that can, in very small, subtle ways, uh, negatively impact our health in ways that we often don't connect with what the thing is that we're being exposed to. Yeah, thank you. Well, how, so I know they can be endocrine disruptors, as you call yes. them, but how exactly are they linked to our hormonal issues? Like, how does that, can you just... Yeah, so there's actually a, a, a bunch of different ways or mechanisms of action that some of these chemicals can um, uh, interfere with our hormones. So first of all, um, it's important to point out that a single chemical might have more than one endpoint or more than one sort of mechanism of action or classification. So for example, um, one chemical might be an endocrine disruptor, so it messes with our hormones, and I'll explain how in just a minute, um, but it also might be a neurodevelopmental toxin, so it might interfere with normal fetal development, brain development. It also might be a carcinogen. And so, or, you know, and might also be a reproductive toxin that affects fertility. So the same chemical can kind of play, um, unfortunately, wear multiple hats in the negative effects that they can, um, that they can have. And so, you know, I try, we just want to uh, reduce our exposures to as many of these as possible because it helps to kind of lower the load overall. So to your question about endocrine disruption specifically, these are chemicals that can interfere with either the development or um, uh, production of uh, our normal hormones that are flowing through our bodies at every moment of every day. Um, hormones regulate everything, everything um, from, you know, our fetal growth and development to, you know, fertility, um, puberty, our moods, our energy, our digestion, our sleep, all of this is and more is regulated by our hormones. And so what happens is we have these uh, uh, xenobiotics, these compounds, these foreign compounds that uh, molecules of chemicals will take bisphenol A as an example, just because a lot of people are familiar with BPA. And if we look at the shape of the BPA molecule, it actually looks a lot like our molecules of say estradiol are one of our um, sex hormones. And so the body actually can't really tell the difference between these two molecules that look really similar. So our hormones function in this lock and key mechanism. So our you know, cells have receptors that are only designed to dock with one specific type of hormone, estrogen, testosterone, thyroid hormone. That's what the lock is made for. And what we have are these, these fake keys, right? These chemicals that are, look like our normal keys, but are not. And they can go in and lock or unlock these uh, dock in these receptors and then turn on or turn off some cascade of effect that can lead to a symptom or tip the scale into some type of um, diagnosis or health issue. So it's very much like a really terrible masquerade party where you have these um, these chemicals that interfere with our normal hormones. And what's fascinating about this conversation is that we don't actually need very much of these exposures to have an impact. Because if we look at how our body actually works, the levels of hormones that are naturally 
going, flowing through our bodies, triggering digestion or triggering um, sleep or triggering menopause, whatever it is, those levels are actually incredibly small because that's the way that the body communicates in these very low levels of hormones. Uh, I like to say that hormones are communication messengers and that they communicate in whispers. They're and that's so quiet. interesting, Lara, because yeah. so often I think in our society, we think things are dose dependent. And yes. you think, okay, as long as there's, you know, and that's what's acceptable. As long as there's a very small amount, no problem. But that's absolutely not the case as you're describing with these with endocrine the, disruptors yeah, specifically yeah. so and that's you know like the dose makes the poison is the foundation of toxicology and for many things i would even say most things that is true so having more of some exposure is going to be worse than having a small amount of exposure unless it's something that our bodies are already biologically wired to uh, uh, to communicate on, or using that same analogy, at very low levels. And that's what our hormones do. Our hormones naturally communicate at these really low levels. So it's the level at which we're being exposed that can actually be more impactful than if we had a really, really high exposure. And that's pretty unique to the endocrine system for certain. And so endocrine disrupting chemicals tend to kind of turn this concept of the dose makes the poison on its head and say, okay, that statement is true, but it's not true always. It's true, but partial. And that's why this field of endocrine disruption or this, this topic of endocrine disruption is so important. And I think it's one of the most important places for people to start paying attention. You know, it's a couple things that I just wanted to comment on. First of all, just for everyone listening with the bones and any kind of endocrine disruption is gonna have a major effect on the bones. So this, this applies to really every single area of our health. What, that's why I think it's so important. But the other thing, you, you, know, you talked about BPA because everybody has heard of BPA and I knew every, people will tell me, oh, no problem. I'm in the grocery store and I don't buy, buy the plastic that says BPA free. Right. Right? It's BPS now, there's different ones. Yeah. So can you comment on you know, are the other ones safe? Or what, what's your feeling on all these alternatives to BPA that are still these chemicals? Yeah, so what I usually say is BPA free is BS. <laughs> That's the short answer there. So what manufacturers do is, you know, they hear this sort of uproar from the public that are like, we don't want BPA, we're reading about BPA is bad. And the companies go, oh, okay, we'll take that out, but we're just gonna swap it with a nearly identical chemical that's in the same family. So for example, instead of bisphenol A, they'll use bisphenol S or bisphenol F and on and on and on. And one, they're ha you know, these are newer replacement chemicals, um, so there's not as robust data in terms of the health effects, but they're molecularly almost identical. So as research has started to look into, okay, well, maybe we're seeing a levels of BPA in um, you know, uh, serum in humans going down, but we're now seeing BPS or BPF going up because we're adding that to everything instead. And the uh, research into the health effects are showing that these chemicals are just as bad, if not worse. So what we, we call this regrettable substitutions, you substitute it with something that like you will eventually end up regretting doing. And so it, for me, it's just marketing. Um, it's, it's just marketing. And I think it, what that requires is consumers to just be more educated and more savvy and not take the face value of what, you know, labeling we see on the front of a package. Uh, the way that I've always uh, explained this, and this is true for food labeling as well, is that the information on the front of the package is there to, um, convince you, right? <laughs> Yes. Um, it's not there to inform you, it's there to convince you. It's the information on the back of the package, and that applies to food, packaged foods, not so much plastics, that is there to inform you. So, you know, that's where um, we have to just be a little bit more savvy as consumers to know when something says BPA free, it, and if it's still a plastic, for example, um, especially like a rigid plastic, because BPA is not in all plastics, and this is something that most people don't know and that companies take advantage of, and I'll give you an example in a second. So first, just because something says BPA-free doesn't mean it's safe. Here's the example of um, BPA, uh, companies taking advantage of the fact that people don't actually know what BPA is. <laughs> so Ziploc bags, 
It is a very soft plastic, obviously. Everybody knows what a Ziploc bag is. And Ziploc has started putting BPA-free labels on all their packaging. Well, Ziploc bags never contained bis bisphenols ever because bisphenols are used to make plastics rigid. Wow. Well, they were never there in the first place. And so that's just deceptive marketing. It's, it's kind of like buzzword marketing. People are like, I don't really know what BPA is, but this one says it's free of it. So I guess it's better. And I'm going to charge, they charge 50 cents more or whatever. It reminds me of, um, you know, I remember this about 10 years ago, Tropicana orange juice was selling an orange juice that was cholesterol free. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, geez, I hope there's no cholesterol. I should hope that there is no cholesterol in that orange juice because their oranges don't have cholesterol. Cholesterol comes from animals, not from plants. And it was during this whole like heart healthy craze. And for the person who's just come from their cardiologist, that's like, oh, you better watch your cholesterol. They're like, well, I better buy this or I better buy this orange juice because it says it's cholesterol free. So it's just companies yeah. that are capitalizing on the ignorance of consumers. And I think that's not okay. So my goal is really to, at least in my business, to educate health professionals so that they can have these more informed and empowered conversations with their clients and patients so they don't get duped by these marketing claims. So BPA, BPA free is BS. A silly mind. question that people might be listening, thinking, okay, well, I thought BPA was the problem with plastics. Are there more is yes. there other things? Yeah, why don't you just go into yeah, that? I so, can just listen to what people, that's what people have said to me. Well, if it's not BPA, then I don't have to worry about it. So why right. don't you, yeah. <laughs> so there's lots of different types of plastics um, uh, on the market and BPA is typically only in one kind. Um, it, it's sort of the poster boy of these plasticizer chemicals and, and certainly the, um, uh, endocrine disrupting chemical that has the most robust body of research. So we tend to talk about it more. But like I said, it's only used in rigid plastics. So think like your travel Starbucks um, cup, your Vitamix blender, your food pro Cuisinart food processor bowl, your Nalgene water bottle. Those are where you're going to find um, polycarbonate plastic, which is where BPA is typically, or its replacements are typically found. When we look at other types of plastics, um, it depends on the type. Some are worse than others, but a lot of these plastics still are able to leach from them endocrine disrupting chemicals. Some of them, some which have been identified, others that have not yet been identified. They just know that these substances can exhibit estrogenic activity. Um, but phthalates, for example, are a, a chemical that's commonly used in softer plastics. So plastics that are more flexible. So if we think of like a garden hose or a shower curtain, those are made of, both of those substances are made of vinyl, so PVC, polyvinyl chloride, that has phthalates added to make it soft and flexible and resilient. And those phthalates very easily migrate out of plastics as well. And so rather than people kind of going, oh, well, what type of plastic is this one? And what type of plastic is this one? It's just easier to say when in contact with food, particularly, I'm going to avoid all plastic. And then in places in my life, like a shower curtain, where I can find a better alternative, like a polyester uh, fabric curtain that you can launder, um, I'm gonna make those choices. So it's, it, we're not just looking at bisphenols, we're looking at phthalates, um, certainly. And then sometimes these softer plastics will also have other chemicals added. Shower curtains contain a chemical called tributyl tin, which has been linked to obesity. It's the first chemical that was dubbed an obesogen. And so, you know, we all know that plastic smell when you open up a new <laughs> shower curtain, like what you're inhaling are phthalates and other uh, chemicals. And so it's not just BPA that we need to be mindful of. Um, I just shared in um, one of the Facebook groups that I manage an article that was just published, I think it was last month, that was looking at all different types of plastics, including these bio-based plastics, right? these polylactic acid um, plastics derived from corn or, you know, sugar cane or whatever. And, you know, based on some research, these seem to also exhibit some estrogenic activity. So plastics are not our friends. They certainly have helped us in a lot of ways. They've made our lives better, easier, faster, safer, all that stuff. 
and that's come at a cost. And so I think if we're dealing with health issues in any capacity, and I would wager that most people are, even though they don't necessarily acknowledge that, um, that we just want to start reducing our exposures to these plastics um, in as many places as possible, starting with what's in contact with our food. And it's not really that hard. Instead of, instead of the Tupperware, you buy the glass containers. Glass, yes. And I think that's what I love about your work is that you give solutions and that- You have to, we have to. And like, you know, I also recognize that not, certainly not everything has a solution, right? And so when something doesn't have a solution and we're like, well, I am just gonna be exposed to this. And there's nothing I can do about it. In those instances, I try to kind of help people dial down the worry or anxiety over that because like stress is also toxic. So we don't want to <laughs> really become anxious over this issue. Um, but in instances where we really can't do anything about our exposure, that's where we focus proactively on our nutrition, on making sure that we're pooping, that we're peeing, that we're sweating, that we have all of, we're supporting the body's ability, innate ability to detoxify and excrete these chemicals because that's what it can do, but it still needs our help. So if I can't deal with the exposure, I'm gonna say, what can I do to help my body get this out? Because I'm never gonna be able to avoid it. And that's life. So right. and our body can handle, I mean, we have detoxification methods. We can handle a certain amount. And as you always yeah. say, I like, I like your, why don't you tell me your analogy? I love it. With the of the boat. rowboat? Yeah, yeah, I love that. So um, this, uh, so this is the analogy that sort of explains, um, you know, why de quote detoxing, and when I'm saying detoxing, I don't mean a, uh, a, you know, a, a detoxification protocol with a medical doctor, but more like a diet detox or a cleanse. Um, is that they don't? It, this is not enough. Um, so I, the story goes like this: Imagine that you're in a rowboat just rowing down the stream, enjoying, enjoying your life. It's a nice, beautiful, sunny day. Um, you look down and you notice that your rowboat has a small hole in the bottom and water is starting to come in. And, you know, in the beginning, you're like, that's not that bad. A little water never hurt anyone, right? That's what everyone says, which possibly is true. And so as time is going on and you're rowing and rowing down the river, enjoying your, you know, Sunday afternoon, you're noticing that the water level is actually getting pretty high. And at a certain point, you start freaking out, right? You're panicking. And so you have a little bucket in your boat, comes with a bucket, and you start bailing it out, bucket full after bucket full, and you're starting to get exhausted and burned out, and the water level is not going down. And eventually, from fatigue, like, you give up. You, your boat fills with water, it sinks, you drown. Or in, uh, in this case, you know, you develop some kind of uh, diabetes, infertility, heart disease, cancer, like something terrible happens to your body because it can no longer handle the load. So the boat is our body. That bucket is our body's natural capacity to detox and that hole in the bottom filling uh, uh, with water, that water is all of these toxic exposures that we're getting. A little bit our body can handle. But once we've reached this certain point, like it doesn't matter how fast you're bailing your bo boat out, you, you, you have to plug the hole first. So in a real life situation, if you were actually out on a stream in a rowboat and you saw a hole in your boat, the very first thing that you would do would go, oh crap, I have to plug that hole now because I'm gonna drown if I don't. And so we need to be proactive and look at toxicity in that through that lens and say, I'm gonna stop this flow of water or I'm gonna slow it so that my bucket can actually be effective. Because if there's only a little water in the boat, your bucket can handle it. But if the water's up to here, your bucket is no longer sufficient. That natural detoxification capacity that we have is no longer sufficient to deal with the volume of toxicity that we have. And I think that's why a lot of people are getting sick is because they're at this threshold. We have more chemicals in commerce than we've ever had in human history. Uh, and many of these chemicals are very persistent. They never break down. Um, uh, you know, they have half lives of maybe 10, 20, or 30 years, which means that it'll take that long to just reduce what's in our body by half, assuming we have no additional expo exposures. Wow. And so, like, that's not realistic. That, you know, so we are just being exposed to so much more, which means that buckets, that boat is actually filling with water a lot faster than it ever has 
before, and we just don't have uh, a detoxification system that can handle all of what we're exposed to. And then, you know, most people don't eat well, they don't eat the nutrient dense food they need to make that bucket a little bit bigger, meaning to amplify their capacity to safely detoxify and excrete these things. You stop the average person on the street and you ask them how many times a day they poop. First of all, don't do that because that would be really <laughs> But, you know, they might, if they honestly answered the question, they might say like, oh, every two days I poop. That's, that's not okay. Like that's not how our body, like we're supposed to be pooping every single day, at least once a day, because that's how we get rid of some of these toxins. And so we're in this space and time where we have more exposures than ever before. And we are also kind of compromising or hamstringing our body's ability to get rid of what it can because we you know, eat too much crappy food with not enough nutrients and we drink too much alcohol that damages our liver or, you know, we just, we don't poop. We don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. We stay up all night looking at our cell phones. And so our lifestyles don't support our detox, um, health, so to speak. So we have to do both. We have to address the exposures and we have to optimize all of the nutrition and gut health and liver health. And that's where all of the, you know, genius comes in from all of my health professionals, because you guys are all masters at doing that. The good thing is, I mean, that's such a good way to put it. And I think the good news though, for people listening is not to freak out as you say, but we can make changes. We can make changes in all areas, which is, which is so wonderful. But I just wanted to go back to the plastic because I know there's a couple things that actually make it worse. So if yes. you're, so why don't you just tell everyone, because besides just being in contact with the food, there's things that can actually exacerbate this. So why yes. don't you tell everybody so, that? Yeah, there's five things that can um, amp up or increase the rate at which these plastic molecules migrate out of the plastic and into your food or water or environment. And those are heat, oil, acidity, abrasion, and time. So heat is when you put hot, you know, you put your plastic in the microwave and you heat it up and there's food in it. Um, Heat also comes into play when you, you know, take your leftover pasta sauce or soup or whatever it is that you've cooked and you're going to go, oh, I'm going to put it in the Tupperware container and then stick it in the fridge. So you're now putting a hot substance in contact with your plastic. Um, Oil, uh, when we put oily foods in contact with plastic, it starts to slowly break down the, the um, the, the plastic itself. Um, so that's going to increase leaching, um, when we have acidic foods in contact. So, you know, not just things like lemon, but tomatoes, tomatoes are quite acidic. So if we look at, and everybody, everybody has had this at one point, you know, this is, I share about this in my class. Um, Margie is the orange stained Tupperware container that like literally everybody has had at one point. And people put it in the dishwasher and they scrub it and it's like never actually ever clean. It always looks orange and people are like, I don't know what's wrong with this. Well, it's a really good illustrative example of what happens when you have hot, oily, and acidic. So it's usually always tomato soup that's or sauce or something like that, some tomato-based um, product that has oil in it that is acidic because it's tomato-based and it's usually hot when it goes into the container. And what happens is you've got this one, two, three punch and you have the, you know, the, where the plastic stops and the sauce starts and this barrier gets blurred. And so what you're actually seeing, the reason why you can't wash the orange off is because it's not on the plastic, it's physically embedded into the structure of the plastic. And so what that also means is that there's been a transfer, right? You have molecules in your, of, of oil that are saturated with these um, lycopene compounds from the tomatoes that are now stuck inside the matrix of the plastic. And that also means that there's plastic molecules that are now in your sauce. So a really good visual. People are like, oh God, I'm throwing out all my plastic containers. Great. Or just reuse them in a non-food area. So like bring them to the garage and put your nuts and bolts in them or use them as an organizational you know, something, put crayons in them, whatever. Um, You know, it's an example of, we don't want to be a plastic phobic. We don't want to be afraid of plastic because plastic will never go away. Um, But we want to be very conscious of our use as it pertains to food primarily. 
That was just so helpful. So a lot of times they sell it with the plastic tops, but I guess as long as that doesn't touch the food. Yeah, yes. Right? So right. yeah, a lot of glass containers, most glass containers actually have plastic lids. I know Pyrex a couple of years ago launched a line that has glass and silicone lids, which are great. So those are my favorite. Oh, that's great. So I want to just touch on the bones for one second because there was an article this in 2019 that was published about triclosan. And what they found was that there was a relationship between, and you'll, I'll let you get into this, but between triclosan and bone density. So when they found triclosan in the urine, um, there was a huge study that they had looked at you know, triclosan in the urine and they found that there was an inverse relationship. So people who had higher triclosan had lower bone density. And so can you go into triclosan? And I know it's not, it's banned now in certain products, but I know it's yes. in some products. So can you just talk a little bit about this triclosan? Because it's it was one study that directly impacts our bones. Yeah, so triclosan or triclosan either way um, is an endocrine disrupting chemical. It's actually registered as a pesticide. Um, and it is a basically used as a broad spectrum like antibacterial, which is why um, it's, it was very commonly used in hand sanitizers. It is still commonly used in hand soaps. It's also found in certain types of toothpaste. I think it's Crest toothpaste um, is the only toothpaste that includes uh, triclosan, and I can explain a little bit of why, which is really interesting. But um, so triclosan is an uh, uh, a endocrine disrupting chemical that seems to directly affect the thyroid. Um, so it directly interferes with normal th thyroid function um, and is linked to a lot of hormonally based uh, health issues, um, including thyroid disease and all of the resulting symptoms of what happens to people when they have reduced thyroid function. And so um, in uh, it's, it's used in uh, thousands and thousands of different types of products, mostly personal care products again, as an antibacterial to make sure that bacteria doesn't grow in the product or to, um, to add some you know, antimicrobial, antibacterial properties. So anytime you buy any kind of consumer product and it says it's antimicrobial or anti, by, uh, antibacterial technology, it's typically because it has some kind of uh, tri uh, triclosan, triclocarbon, there's actually 16 or 17 um, ingredients that sort of fall into this bucket um, in it. And these are not chemicals that we want to be exposed to at all. Um, and what's interesting, so in 2016, the FDA um, banned the use of triclosan, triclocarbon, and these 15 or 16 other compounds only in hand sanitizers, commercial hand sanitizers. So when you go to the store, your Purell or whatever no, used to have triclosan in it as the antibacterial ingredient. And that has been banned because these companies couldn't actually prove that the triclosan in the product was actually um, doing anything. Because reg like, for example, also in, in um, hand soaps, they said, look, it's not, it's not actually doing anything. The FDA didn't admit necessarily that there's a health risk. They were like, in light of maybe there's a health risk. The bigger issue was like, you're, you're unnecessarily exposing people to a chemical that like you literally cannot prove that it's doing anything. So totally ineffective. And so they were banned from hand, commercial hand sanitizers. For, so for people who work in a clinical setting, Triclosan is still used in the hospital setting in hand sanitizers. Yes. Really? Yeah. And I actually talked to a student of mine who um, I think she was a nurse and was saying that they basically do audits at the, like you have to, you are required as a condition of your employment to use these hand sanitizers throughout the day. There is, and like no alternatives are permitted. So like, it's really terrible. Oh my um, so in the clinical setting, they're still used and they're used a lot. So I had no idea. I just assumed they were gone once. No, they, yeah. only banned from commercial yeah. use. And so, um, you know, there's, but they're not, oh, and only from hand sanitizers. So they're still found in makeup and deodorant and all of these other products that are trying to market themselves as having antibacterial properties. And what's interesting is I just learned this. I haven't 
um, look this up to verify, but I was just talking to um, um, a dentist who knows a lot about the sort of back end mechanics of the dental industry and, and was saying that the reason why Crest Colgate toothpaste still contains triclosan is because Crest owns a triclosan factory. Like they own the factory that produces this chemical, so they need they need a place to put it, basically. Hard, hard um, to believe. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so you know, it's still like I said, it's still found in thousands of products, and it's because um, uh, it is a quote active ingredient. It does require disclosure on the label, so you'll see you know active ingredient, whatever percentage of triclosan, and so this is an easy ingredient to spot on a label and just say, I'm not gonna buy that product, I'll buy something else that doesn't contain uh, triclosan. And for things like hand sanitizers, you know, so long as it's alcohol-based, um, it's fine, you don't really need anything uh, beyond that, like it's some type of um, um, alcohol. A lot of these hand sanitizers also have fragrances. Fragrances are another, you know, sort of catch-all uh, uh, term for chemicals that endocrine disrupting chemicals that we can be exposed to um, so you know essential oils can be really great for if you're on the go hand sanitation you know whether it's a thyme oil or a lavender essential oil um, there's a giant body of research into how essential oils can actually um, exhibit these really potent antibacterial antimicrobial microbial antifungal um, properties which is why a lot of people use them for cleaning so that's great. So really we should avoid, if it says, unless it's an essential oil, antibacterial, antimicrobial on the label. Yes. And what's, yeah. And what's really interesting is um, in non-consumables, meaning non-food related products, other consumer products, um, what you'll see instead of the word triclosan, because you know that like a pillow doesn't have an ingredient label, your socks don't have ingredient labels, but the same um, triclosan has been rebranded under the trade name microban when it's wow. used in things like cutting boards and pizza wheels and socks and bed sheets. And people are like, look, at my bed sheets are antimicrobial. My socks are antimicrobial. This cutting board is antimicrobial. And so it's just a marketing gimmick, but it's these products can contain the same types of antibacterial chemicals. So wow. Yeah. So the thing is, as you always say, everything's in plain sight, you know, in terms of giving people the top things, because I really, you know, want people to get there's so much to take away yes. from this. But if you wanted to just where should because a lot of times it is overwhelming, like where should oh, yeah. people start? And what would be your, your top recommendations for people going forward? Where, where yeah. do you begin? So I think, you know, because this topic can be overwhelming and people sometimes freak out and go, oh my gosh, this is going to be really expensive for me to address. Start with what's free and easy, right? So what's free and easy is throw out, stop buying, this will actually save people money, all of the scented candles, Febreze, air fresheners, um, diffu uh, not uh, like reed diffusers, those stick diffusers that you stick in a little thing of oil. All of those um, products are made with synthetic fragrances that not only are endocrine disrupting, but also expose you to a lot of other volatile chemicals that can be carcinogens. And these home fragrances release these chemicals that get trapped in the air inside your homes. Right, so we just want to not bring these items into our homes in the first place, and that's a really easy way to really dramatically reduce your exposures every single day. Is get rid of the scented candles, get rid of the air fresheners, the plug-ins, the sprays. Um, if somebody wants their house to smell nice, get a good quality essential oil, diffuse that. Right, like that's how you can maintain what you like as in terms of a home fragrance without exposing yourself to these um, harmful chemicals. The second free and easy is to open your windows. So as I was saying, all these chemicals get trapped in our homes and we tend to not open our windows, but the EPA has found that indoor air pollution is actually five to 10 times worse than what's outside because we bring all these items that are made with chemicals, that off-gas chemicals into our homes, and then we never open the windows. So we wanna let those, those VOCs, those volatile chemicals get out and we wanna bring fresh air in. So third free and easy is taking off your shoes when you walk in the door. It doesn't seem like it 
it's meaningful, but we bring in a lot of pesticides and heavy metals and um, uh, particulate matter from air from uh, automobile exhaust from walking down the sidewalk into our home. So just take off the shoes when you come into your home. Those are the easiest things that people can do. From there, focus on um, organic food, right? Organic food is much lower in uh, levels of these uh, pesticides. Uh, doesn't have any of the really, really concerning um, organophosphate uh, uh, pesticide residues that are found in conventional foods. Those pesticides are endocrine disrupting, they can be neurotoxic, um, they can be developmental and reproductive toxins. So these are, we just want to um, reduce our exposures as much as possible. And what's great, and this is an illustration of how well our body can work if we give it a chance, most of those pesticides are not persistent, which means that they actually can be excreted really quickly. And a number of different intervention studies have shown that when people switch from a conventional uh, diet with conventionally raised fruits and vegetables to a mostly organic diet, they can actually drop the levels of circulating pesticides by 80 to 90 percent in just three to five days. So wow, really, incredible. really quickly. Yeah, really quickly. So if the mom needs some motivation to be like, it's more expensive. Yes, but you can have a really dramatic effect on what you're being exposed to before the week is out, which is really a powerful motivator. Um, looking at those plastics in the kitchen is the next step. Like swap those out, start putting your food in glass. Um, you know, you can use mason jars. These are really, really cheap if you don't want to go out and buy new containers. Um, that's a really important one. I think also looking at our packaging, so limiting canned foods. Canned foods are going to be lined with bisphenol chemicals. S, A, S, F, whatever it says, that is a significant exposure source. So um, for example, some studies were looking at what happens when people eat a can of tomato-based soup. BPA levels shot up 244% after just one day of eating um, a couple of servings of canned foods. So can I ask you a question on that? Yeah. Because there are some organic companies that are really good. So they yes. make that should be safe, correct? With the liner that Not they Not necessarily, use? no. Oh, really? So yeah, so um, the um, FDA only permits certain materials to line the inside of cans. And there are some companies like Eden Organics, for example, that their label says BPA free and they're, they're actually, that's actually accurate because they're using a vegetable based oleo resin on their can, which is actually what cans were lined with before BPA was developed. Um, the problem is that oleo resin lining is not permitted for highly acidic foods. So the only linings that are permitted for highly acidic foods are these bisphenol chemicals or some of the newer generation of can linings, which are typically made with vinyl plastics and other um, types of plastics, which are also not great. They fall into the regrettable substitution category as well. So when wow. it comes to like organic is great because it means no pesticides, but organic doesn't Organic certification stops when it comes to packaging. Like there's no guidelines for how the food is packaged. And so um, when we're looking at acidic foods like tomatoes, which is the primary one, we want to buy it in a jar when possible. And thankfully, certainly not broadly available, but more companies um, are starting to do jarred tomatoes instead of canned tomatoes. So that's right. what we want to buy when possible um, because those are going to be the better option. Okay, great. Wow. The, um, right. So I guess if a company, if you're getting beans from like Eden, come from Eden, yes. those will be okay because yes. they're not acidic and they're, they have a different lining. So it's they so have a different lining. Yeah. So it's just, it's, it is really like, oh, frankly, it's annoying that like the consumer has to be this informed and be that much of a detective. But unfortunately, you know, there's not a lot of transparency in these industries. And so we are left to kind of figure it out on our own, which is not wow. cool. Well, here's the thing. Um, before we go, I could talk to you for 10 hours because you have so much information. So also what things should people absolutely, you mentioned the plastics, you mentioned the um, fragrance, if they see fragrance, yes. um, we mentioned phthalates, you mentioned the triclosan, you yes. mentioned, um, how, I guess, what other ones should they absolutely avoid? 
I mean, I think it's uh, uh, certainly fragrance as a catch-all, not just in your home fragrances, but in all your personal care products and also household cleaners. These tend to be bigger projects for people because it's not just one product. It's like, oh, there's like 20 different personal care products and that feels overwhelming. So, um, you know, certainly looking for the word fragrance on a label as somebody's working their way through cleaning up those products, looking for the word parabens, uh, looking for sodium laurel or sodium laureth sulfate. Um, there's dozens and dozens of ingredients, but I think the sort of hot list ones, like if, if at a minimum you can just eliminate um, the word fragrance or perfume, it's sometimes listed as perfume, and um, uh, parabens, that's a great start to just avoid those. Both of those are endocrine disrupting. Um, I know that a, a new paper just came out that I just started to work my way through showing that um, paraben exposure is linked to increased obesity and offspring for women that are exposed while pregnant. Um, so, yeah, you, know, you know, the interesting thing about that, Lara, is that the American College of, of Obstetricians and Gynecologists just sent that. My husband's an OBGYN, so we just got a memo. Right. Yeah. So it's getting out there and people are paying attention, which I think is all so good and there's just so much information but what but you have a great instagram and you're really wonderful about sharing information and so i think we'll, we'll have that link for everybody because as i said we could talk and you're my teacher but larry is amazing at his teaching professionals and it's helped me i just have to thank you so much because i've learned so much from you that then i in turn have taught all the people i work with and excellent I, I think what's important for everybody who's listening is just to start somewhere, right? Just yes. start anywhere and anything you can do is reducing that load in your rowboat. And it's going to make a huge, huge difference in your bones, in every aspect of your health. And it's just not something when you go to the doctor and it's not something the first thing I say to someone, you know, is, oh, you, Certainly. Know, but, you know, let's reduce your toxic load, but it does play a factor and it is a big role. And I think once you start reducing, and it's not hard. It really isn't. From, I mean, I started one thing at a time, like changing my lipstick, then changing, you know, the cosmetics to a better company, and then the cookware, and then just and what's, these, these Yeah, clothes. and what's great is because more consumers are becoming aware of this topic, the number of options available in the marketplace has exploded. So 10 years ago, when I started doing this work, there was like, you know, only a tiny number of ca uh, companies that were making what I thought to be better like makeup and skincare that didn't have these ingredients. And now there's hundreds and hundreds of these companies that have committed to making clean products, which is really wonderful because it means that we now have, it's just a lot easier for us to make these changes. Um, and then I'll also add that, you know, this is a process and I don't want people to think that like, oh my God, I'm freaking out. It's not the single exposures that are the most concerning. It's the cumulative exposures that we get over our lifetimes. And so we just want to start chipping away at that. And if it takes people six months or a year or six years or 10 years, so long as you're incrementally moving, you know, in that direction, that's great. I've been doing this in, you know, researching and making these changes in my own life for 12 years, and there's still more that I can do. And so I, it, the journey is never finished. Um, and there's not, like I said earlier, you know, there's some exposures that we can't do anything about. And I just choose to not worry about those because I don't need added stress in my life. I don't need to be freaking out about everything. There's usually like an initial freak out period and hopefully that will dissipate, but that dissipates more quickly when we move into action. So if we stay in overwhelm, we tend to be frozen. If we start moving in, into action and doing things, that overwhelm tends to shrink and become really manageable. And in fact, it tends to kind of be a big motivating push for people to actually do something, which is the whole point. So, you know, there's a lot more options out there for us and it doesn't need to happen overnight is, is where I would. Um, that, was, that was so beautifully said because right, to start stressing yourself and getting stress hormones. Yeah. It, it's just not working. But I did the same thing. I think I started, I've started a while ago, but one thing at a time. And then my very last thing was, my, was hair color. I, I was yes. going to the same place forever. And then I said one day, I don't want these chemicals. So I changed to a different place and I actually like it better. You know, right. and, yeah. you know it's, it's funny. Actually, all the products I like better than I was using before. 
it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's bad. it's certainly a marketing myth yeah. that you know these really expensive high end, um, you know, department store Lancome brands that they're any different than what you get at Walmart. Like they still use the same toxic chemicals, so they're not any better for you. It's just what you're paying for is marketing and packaging and branding. That's all. And so just because something is more expensive doesn't mean it's better. Um, and you know, I think that in the very early years of of producing these clean, non-toxic uh, beauty products, like they weren't that great, but now they're amazing. Now yeah. they're just as good, if not better than, um, you know, the, the conventional stuff. So there's lots of options out there for people. Um, I have a curated list of products that I like um, and share about up on my website. Um, I post about them on my Instagram, which is, um, my handle is at um, environmental toxins nerd. Uh, so people can come and follow me over there. I share a ton of information um, every day on, you know, new studies that are coming out, ways that we can uh, start reducing our exposures, ways that we can shed some of the stress and anxiety over this. Um, and uh, yeah, and so for anybody who's, who is a practitioner who, um, like you, Margie, wants to learn more about this so that they can have deeper conversations with their clients or patients or even their customers, depending on the work that they do. Um, I would just invite them all to come check out the courses that I have um, on my website, which is lauraadler.com, and um, just get in touch with me there. Yeah, because they really, I, I mean, what I, what I love about you, Lara, is that, is that you really you know, make it easy. It, you, you take, I mean, you've been the, the person who synthesized all the information so yeah. that you just put it in manageable things and things you can easily do that can have such a huge impact on yes. your health as well as your clients and your patients' health. So you, I just have to thank you because you're doing so much work in this world that's like just helping so many of us. And by spreading it to practitioners, then they in turn are spreading it to people, you know, all the people they work with. So I think you're really thank making a, you. a big impact on the world. And I, 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 I thank you so much. And I thank you for taking the time to be here with all of us. And I'll have all the links to your website and your Instagram and as well. But thank you. And I just always love seeing you and getting all this great information. Aww. I always learn new things. And I, I, I continue to take your courses. When I knew when your water course came out, I took that. It's yes. and, and you can always do things with it. That's what I like. It's yes. not, oh my gosh. It's not like that at all. It's like, okay, step one is easy. I'll do this. And step two. And then you really end up realizing how you reduce that toxic load. And that's just so good for your health your bones, everything. So yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that. You know, I do this work in a vacuum sometimes. So it's wonderful to see my students out in the world doing this work and engaging with their with their clients and patients. And I think that's like that's the most rewarding part is seeing the conversation grow. So thank you for being pro proactive and forward thinking and recognizing the the importance of this topic in the work that you're doing with your audience. So, uh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to staying in touch. So thanks so much again. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. I hope you've enjoyed today's interview with Lara as much as I have. And now I have some great ways to start reducing the toxins in your life. All the links we talked about, Lara's website and Instagram will be in the show notes. And do take advantage because she has fabulous resources there. And if you are a healthcare practitioner, do contact her if you're interested in taking any of her courses so that you can pass this information on to the people that you work with. I'm a big fan. I've taken numerous of her courses and use this information on a regular basis. So bye for now and look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Happy Bones, Happy Life podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please subscribe on your favorite listening app so that you don't miss any amazing insights on upcoming episodes. And until next time, continue to live your best life ever. See you soon.